Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Art Science Connect series. Today's panel brings together Berlin-based media artist and theorist Hitosh Dero and Italian IT innovator Francesca Bria to discuss what a data commons might look like, where personal statistics are organized from the bottom up rather than structured by state and corporate interests. We are looking forward to a fascinating conversation on the digital revolution and its relationship to democracy. So the topic is data and democracy, and I would like to take you through this topic in three different steps, namely what was it in what I call now web one, the early internet, web two, the web of social media, and now potentially web three blockchain based. What was the relation of data and democracy like on the early internet? The slogan of this relationship has never changed. It's the same since the 90s. It says that digital technology will improve democracy automatically. It's not really being said how and why. Okay, there is improved access, equality will somehow miraculously rise and so on and so on. The slide shows where these internet revolutions migrated to, and you can easily see that almost 20 years later, none of these countries are doing all too well. And this is Web 1. And in Web 2, I think that everyone remembers in the stage of social media, starting from around 2011, it's Facebook that is supposed to bring democracy through a series of rebellions culminating in the Syrian war, which is still ongoing. And right now, at the threshold to Web3, based on blockchain infrastructure and decentralized crypto networks. This specific type of color revolt has also reached the West. The storm on capital was a perfect example of a kind of Western color revolution triggered by some sort of Twitter, Facebook upheaval. And of course, this not only reached the US, but also us in Germany. These are conspiracy theorists and right-wingers on the steps of our own parliament in Berlin last August. This is the same scene in the credits of my most recent video, Social Sim. And the most disappointing thing is that even... Now in the Web3, there is a similar rhetorics again of access, uh, equality, opportunity of democratizing the art world, of getting rid of corruption, middlemen, and all of that. So I think that right now it's time to once and for all just cancel the idea that digital technology is in any way automatically linked political progress and that we rather ought to see it, especially through the lens of all these internet revolts as waves of original accumulation, which means waves of digital or in fact also real land grabs, property grabs, data grabs, privatization grabs. So I think it would be time to talk about the real potential benefits of the Web3, which would consist in decentralization, in data sovereignty, which are part of this blockchain-based Web3 now forming on the horizon. This kind of technology would lend itself to replace the platform corporations with platform cooperatives. Obviously, data has become a commodity. And today we have very few companies, five or seven large corporations that are able to extract data and then use data to fuel artificial intelligence engines and create predictive services using the data that we produce. I mean, using private data, public data, and people personal data. Well, if we see what those big companies are actually trading and selling, a lot of it is the data we produce, our social behavior, who we are uh, in the form of data. And we have to look at the social, ethical, racial, and geopolitical implications of automated decisions and also of artificial intelligence. Intelligence. So we know that when we use technologies and data, this is at higher price. We understand how it is important for public administration and for citizens and for workers to claim back the sovereignty of data, or at least demanding algorithmic transparency and algorithmic accountability. 
So in Barcelona, we decided to basically bet on a different model. We were betting on a model where data is not controlled by the big corporations, the big tech, and is not controlled by the big states. And we enforce data sovereignty, data portability, and data ethics in the procurement contracts of the city of Barcelona. So that any company that was winning the bid in order to provide the service for the city of Barcelona had to give back the data in machine readable format and this data would be considered as a public infrastructure as a public good and put out at the service of citizens themselves so data can be really used to do energy monitoring water metering parking monitoring garbage collection noise monitoring i mean we have a really wide range of applications where it is really important to have a standardized ontology but also to be able to use this data at the service of the public goods. We have created this cryptographic infrastructure so that citizens can decide what data they wanna keep private, what data they wanna share and on what terms. So they become data entitlement. So this data would be used really for public projects. And I think this is the question of the creation of public value. So digital and data for whom, to do what and what kind of value are we producing? Is this public value that we can share or is this private value that, that can only be appropriated by very few players? Because we need citizens to reacquire, let's say, digital rights as citizenship rights. So I think we need this bottom-up experimentation and participation where artists have to play a big role. Because at the end, it's not about changing the digital or changing the technology. It's about using those kind of infrastructure for collective imagination, collective coordination, and collective awareness, this common digital infrastructure, in order to change society. So how to bring this about? How to avoid the pitfalls we have seen in both of the earlier phases of the internet, that basically those spaces were opened up for privatization and appropriation and corporatization and deregulation, how to avoid this for the next phase? I think we have to be very serious about regulation at a global level to block this concentration of powers. We have to understand that, you know, what is digital privacy? It has to be built into the business model of these companies. When we see the problems of the digital space, even as like fake news or conspiracy theory, hate speech, uh, the inability of people to really democratically come together. This is also because at the core of the business model of those platforms, I mean, we are using data and personal information I mean, trading and selling personal information as a commodity and manipulating personal information. Kito, you once talked about sort of this interesting evolution in my mind from the sort of idea of Marx's idea of commodity fetishism, you know, the object, we could say then to De Boer's idea of the society as a spectacle. But now you have what you call the chimeras, these sort of creations, these almost like artificial living things that exist within the cybersphere. I'm just wondering how these things could be wrestled into some sort of more democratic citizen control. People have given over their social relations to be governed by opaque algorithms. So maybe this is the first thing really to recover and not to hand over, you know, so easily to anyone. The automation of social relations is really the one type of automation that actually no one needs. Why should one automate social relations? You know, why should one automate democratic decision making? It's really not necessary. I mean, this is the one activity that by performing it creates the social. It, it, there is no need to automate it. There's also no need to automate communication via social media in my view. Further than that, I think the problem is when the automation of social exchanges and social relationships automatically means monetization with a very asymmetric relation of power, let's put it that way. And I think that that's clear that that's what's not changing in the blockchain space. I mean, actually, by making these type of markets of commodifying social relationship, you are creating a bigger problem, if you wish, because instead of, let's say, 
finding new forms of organization, you are actually shifting these property rights somewhere else in the financial world. Rethinking culture from the bottom up, really. How is that going to function? And how would that function within this idea of a broader smart city? Uh, what kind of counter institutions maybe could we think of in the smart city? If I think of smart city, then I just think of how Toronto pulled out of being a smart city. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was the problem? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, Google was trying to redevelop a part of the waterfront into a basically Google-powered smart city with a lot of, you know, the usual schnick-schnack door sensors and, and whatnot. And uh, Toronto was fine with it for a while, but then uh, pulled out. There was a lot of pressure coming from citizens' groups because the contracts were not public, so it was not clear how the data that was gathered about everybody and the real estate value would be monetized, and the people had questions over the legitimacy of the of the model. So then the city council had to pull out. I guess the question really is, how do you get all these fantastic ideas out to a broader mm -hmm. public, especially ones that are dependent on these same platforms like Google, that screwed up Toronto. Because that's one of the key problems of the smart city. Actually, this has been that if you outsource all this information and data to whatever, I mean, to big tech or to other companies or just externalize it, you lose the capacity involving citizens in the decision making to take decisions about the future of the cities. I gave a lecture at the RCA who were going through a fee strike and I NFT'd the whole institution for them. <laughs> uh, asking in return that they sent me a recording of a live role play in which they transform this institution into a worker and student self-managed place. So this is the this is the economy, right? It's a gift economy, <laughs> but of, or maybe a barter economy. And I'm very happy to tell you that I actually do also own the NFT and the Ethereum address of the Museum of Modern Art. So we could easily do something similar in this case. Actually, web one activity where people squatted other people's uh, domain names. So <laughs> that's what I just did. Does that mean we're kind of returning to the era of tactical media? We're kind of coming back around circling. Good. We've come full circle now. We have to start anew. I hope the Zapatistas will lead the way again. I don't think we need to go back to tactical media, actually. I think that these conversations have to be at the very core of our political sphere. They have to be the conversations of our elected representatives in all, in all places of power. And they, and they are serious because, uh, you know, we have to rethink how we're going to build um, hospitals and public health care for all and education is being reshaped and uh, we have this ecological crisis and the ecological trans transition where we need to change the built environment and the way we do we build our cities we need to regain rights which are labor environmental gender workers uh, citizens rights and if we move into this kind of techno solutionism with one way trajectory uh, where we're all gonna you know in a while gonna drive tesla cars drinking tesla coffees go to hospitals run by amazon and our transportation um, run by google and uber do we like this world i'm not sure it seems abundantly clear that we are not moving into a sort of you know futurist mass colonization future but into some kind of digital <laughs> feudalism basically the new dark ages. And I think that's what we are facing. I mean, uh, yes, there is a future and maybe time is still moving according to the second law of thermodynamics, but we are moving forward into feudalism and probably uh, the future that Francesca described will be interrupted, you know, by color revolutions, uh, popping <laughs> on and off, you know, of, across the screens and pushing in an age of vernacular Vernacular fragmentation, maybe this is what I would call it, which is in a way neutral. It's not necessarily bad if it's networked, but I think this is where we're headed to. It doesn't have anything to do with the idea of progress in modernism.